As I was ushered through the Hall of Governance, I slowed to admire the artwork scattered throughout the premises. Murals depicting the cosmos, carvings of ancient deities, cultural artifacts from eons ago. Commander Rykov. The Yendil guard said my name slowly, since his species had difficulty pronouncing the R sound. Is there a reason you have stopped? I shook my head, just looking. It's fascinating, a showcase of every... You can browse the exhibits at another time. The Senate is waiting, he growled. Right, right. Perhaps I should have been irritated by this guy's impatience, but frankly, I was just happy he wasn't afraid of me. Most aliens I had spoken to since my arrival were walking around on eggshells, terrified of saying the wrong thing. Despite centuries of restraint and nonviolence, they thought humans would snap on a whim. Why had Terra and Command insisted on my testimony before the Senate? Why bother to comply with their subpoena? This would just be the next farce, the latest inquisition against humanity. I forced a smile as I strolled into the central chamber, sensing all eyes turned toward me. The new speaker was standing at the lectern, glancing over a briefing packet. His name was Retke, formerly the Covian ambassador. His species was middle of the pack on the aggression scale, and he was one of the younger representatives in the Senate. Other than that, I didn't know much about him, but I wasn't expecting him to give us a fair shake. This was his golden opportunity to prove himself and to earn political points with Ula's supporters. Commander Rykov of the planet Earth, please have a seat at the designated bench. Retke's voice was smooth and silky pleasant to the ears. I'm sure you understand why you are here. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I am aware of what you wish to discuss, I replied. He tapped his claws on the lectern. Very good. It has been an interesting few weeks, has it not? I sighed. That is one way of putting it. I think many of our listeners have valid concerns about the events that transpired. Would you not view your nanite weapons as cruel and excessive? Depends who they're used against. And who decides who deserves such a fate, Commander? I do not believe all humans are evil, as my predecessor did. But some of you are. You know this. What happens if your weapons fall into the wrong hands? As tempting as it was to argue, this guy was actually making sense. All it took was a few trigger. Happy idiots in the chain of command to set off Armageddon. The same reason nuclear proliferation had almost ended in human extinction. It was too easy to rush to judgment, as we had almost done with the devourers at the start of this mess, before we learned the full picture. Those are valid questions, Mr. Speaker. But let me ask you, what happens when the next devourers come for us? I paused, giving my words time to marinate. How do we protect the Federation without some sort of deterrent? Answering a question with a question. You should run for office, Commander. You're a natural. A few light chuckles came from the representatives. I can see the wisdom in having a last resort, as you say. But there needs to be fail-safes, oversight, transparency. If you truly desire peace, these weapons do not belong in the hands of one species alone. I narrowed my eyes. That's not my call, Mr. Speaker. Is there something else that I can answer? Yes, yes. Your government has failed to offer a sufficient explanation for several matters. Let's start with the easy question. Where is General Killan? Your ambassador claimed he was a passenger on your ship, and nobody has heard from him since. Kailan. I was fortunate that he accepted the first officer position on my ship, given his intelligence and qualifications. But while he hadn't complained about his circumstances, at least to me, I knew his heart was with his home. It was my fault he would never see his planet again. The least I could do was preserve his honor and let him retire in the history books as a hero. He is dead. Uneasy murmurs rippled through the chamber and I offered an apologetic glance to Jatari, Ambassador Palam. Shot through the abdomen during our shootout with the Zanuck. Nothing we could do. Please accept my most sincere condolences. He was a good soldier and a better man. 
Speaker Retka's eyes scanned my figure in a quick motion. It seemed he was gauging my body language. The truth not only would devastate Kylon, but would implicate the Terran Union in illegal genetic experimentation. If there was any hope of salvaging our relationship with the Federation, this was a cover story that they needed to buy. I bowed my head, closing my eyes. Images of the Devourer homeworld floated through my mind, as vivid as when I had been standing on the bridge a week ago. The same memories I saw every night when I tried to sleep. Instead of pushing them away, I turned my focus on them. The sprawling oceans and the faint orange glows dotted across the landmasses screamed that life was present. I imagined the children witnessing their final sunrise, not realizing the fate that was about to befall their race. The heat wave vaporizing the surface, extinguishing a million souls in an instant. A people doomed by their own creation. Perhaps in another life we would have been friends. Or perhaps in another life we would have suffered their fate. Commander Rykoff, the speaker shouted my name into the microphone, jolting me out of my trance. His nostrils flared, which I believe was an expression of concern for his species. I didn't mean to distress you. We'll change the subject. I breathed a silent sigh of relief. Retke needed to see a genuine display of grief, to be convinced, and that was the only way I could give it to him. Next matter. I'd like to preface this question by expressing gratitude on the behalf of the Federation. If you hadn't stepped in, I think we'd be the property of the Asenic Republic right now, he said. I hesitated. This speaker was tactful with his words, but something told me a but was about to follow. It was my pleasure. That said, your government claims Ambassador Kazil was killed by friendly fire. I'd be more inclined to believe that if every individual in the Axenic line of succession didn't turn up dead within a day of the capital incursion, Rett muttered. Is that an accusation? You know as well as I do that there was a coup. Ordinary Xanic citizens seized the palace and executed their leaders. It was live-streamed to the galaxy. If only it were that simple. These were the most well-armed, ordinary citizens I've ever seen. Do normal insurgents have sniper drones and automatic rifles on your world, Commander Rykov? Well, the answer to that was affirmative, but saying that wouldn't portray humanity in a positive light. No, I suppose not. What are you getting at? I'm saying someone armed them. Someone also gave the populace reason to rebel by flooding their economy with cryptocurrency, making it so they couldn't afford basic necessities. Speaker Rett caused, meeting my eyes. It would stand to reason the same entity is responsible for both things, and the Terran Union has already been linked to the financial attack. I lowered my gaze. I'm not saying humans did it, but if we did, it would have been for the greater good for centuries. The Xanic administration has been relentless in its pursuit of expansion and conquest. Their government required drastic changes to put a stop to it. A series of anxious whispers rippled through the assembly, as my words were practically an admission of guilt. I risked a glance at the audience and noticed Ambassador Johnson in her assigned seat, shaking her head. It was clear she didn't approve of my response. But what else could I say? This new speaker was a bit too clever and had already put the pieces together on his own. Denying it would just make us out to be liars and give the Federation further reason to distrust us. Retka waited for the conversation to die down before responding, a naive, simple-minded way of thinking. What is that supposed to mean? I demanded. You assume that the next government will be any better. You do not consider the possibility that it may be worse, he replied. The old regime was elected by the citizens. It carried out the will of the people. You cannot solve systemic problems by killing a few individuals. I found myself agreeing with the speaker in spite of my allegiance. The modus operandi of the intelligence agency was asinine to me. I had been telling my brother as much for years. By toppling the Asenic Republic, they had created a power vacuum. 
In all likelihood, they were replacing a democratic aggressor with an authoritarian one. A tired sigh escaped my lips. Time will tell. Is that all? One more question. What happened to the devourers? He asked. Their star went nova, and their system was destroyed. It was technically the truth. Three billion years before its natural end, and right as a fleet was on its way to Earth, convenient timing. Perhaps it was divine intervention, Mr. Speaker. I think not. This is your last chance to come clean, Commander. Don't force my hand. I don't know what you're talking about. Then I'll show you. If you'll turn your attention to the projector, you'll see footage from a classified stealth probe that was monitoring the devourer system. Horror shot through my veins as a video began to play on the wall behind the speaker. It showed a lone vessel on approach to a luminous star. While the exterior of the ship was charred and flayed, the Terran emblem was still visible on the hull. It wouldn't have mattered if it weren't, since the make and model of the flagship was so distinctive. The Senate watched in stunned silence as the flagship deposited a capsule into the star's corona. Gravity did the rest of the work, drawing the projectile toward the surface. A sick feeling crawled into the pit of my stomach, and I wanted to be Greg to turn the tape off. Instead, I just sat there, eyes glued to the screen. The speaker pressed the fast-forward button on his holopad and skipped ahead to the star's final moments. The fiery gases swirled down toward the core, like water, circling down a drain. With a shudder, the vibrant orb collapsed in on itself. It shrank until it was no longer visible. All that remained was blackness where the star had been. For a few seconds, the universe was at peace. Then there was a blinding white flash that washed out the camera's view. It only appeared on the projector for a moment before the transmission cut out. Suffice to say, that probe was a goner. So tell me, was that a different ship? That just happens to look like yours, Commander. Disgust briefly flashed on Retke's face before he regained his composure. You know, it would be nice to get a smidge of honesty from you, humans. That, that bomb only has one purpose. The extermination of a species. Why would you build such a weapon? Please, enlighten me. My mouth felt dry, and I could hear the blood rushing in my ears. Why did the Federation have to bear witness to that atrocity? The representatives shared aghast expressions, and panic chatter began to spread through the chamber. I caught some of the phrases, like several people calling humanity monsters and demons. I took a deep breath, trying to find the right words. We built it because we knew someday extermination might be necessary. Look, there was no other way. Perhaps that is true. But what is necessary is not always right, he said. So you think we're wrong. You think we're monsters, just like everyone else, don't you? I stood up from my seat, red-hot anger racing through my body. This whole trial had been a trap, hadn't it? No wonder Retke had such a calm demeanor. He had that footage in his back pocket the whole time. What is it that you want? Humanity kicked out of the Federation. Me, imprisoned for war crimes. No, actually, I was going to ask you to lead our military. Impassioned protests broke out across the Senate, but the Speaker raised a paw for silence. Friends, the humans cannot help what they are, but they're trying to change. They've never wronged us. They managed to convince us that they were the most peaceful species in the galaxy for centuries. Mistakes have been made by all of us. I want to move forward together, without hatred standing in the way. I believe this human and his associates will make us stronger and safer. I gaped at Retke in disbelief. I don't know what to say. You can think about it, but know if you accept. This pattern of lies and omissions must end here, and for the universe's sake, don't invent any more bombs. I think humanity has more than enough as is. I'd like the galaxy to still exist tomorrow, you know.
Perhaps there was a future where we could be friends with the Federation once more. Things would be different, but maybe they should be. It was my sincere hope that we would never use our worst weaponry again. I wanted the galaxy to still exist tomorrow, too. Were the humans actually getting a reward for the genocide of an entire species? The Federation might as well remove the words peace and equality from its mission statement if the speaker was putting those savages in charge of the military. An abominable race like theirs did not belong positions of power, and it never would happen under my leadership. I had done everything I could to expose their nature, and just when I thought I was getting somewhere, the narrative shifted. The humans framed me as the villain, and the Federation bought it hook, line, and sinker. One moment, I was their beloved speaker, champion of democracy, protector of the innocent. The next, they kicked me to the curb, all on the basis of a few unsavory memos from years ago. Where had I gone wrong? Was there anything I could have done differently? There would be plenty of time to think after I cleared out my office. I rummaged through the final drawer of my desk, searching for anything worth bringing home. Beneath a stack of documents, there was a single framed photo. It was turned upside down and covered by a thick coating of dust. This picture clearly hadn't been touched in years. Curiosity sparked in my chest, and I flipped it over. A younger version of myself was standing side by side with Ambassador Johnson, holding a document. I remembered that day. We had been at the signing of a war crimes treaty, which the humans sponsored. They said they wanted to mitigate suffering, and they had seemed so genuine in their commitment to peace. At the time, I wanted to be just like them. A growl rumbled in my chest, and I hurled the picture to the floor. The frame shattered, sending shards glass everywhere. Careful. You wouldn't want to step on that while you're leaving this office. For the last time at that. A curse escaped my lips as I glanced behind me and saw Ambassador Johnson leaning against the doorframe. She was the last person I wanted to speak to. I had no idea how long she had been there, but her smirk suggested she had seen enough. Come to gloat. You got what you wanted, just leave me be, I spat. The human disappeared, and for a brief moment, I thought she might actually leave me alone. Instead, she returned with a broom and a dustpan and began mopping up the glass shards. I clenched my teeth, repulsed by her proximity. You and your filthy species ruined everything. My life, my government, my job. It's not that bad. Lots of positions out there to fill, she chirped. You know... I heard they're hiring at Galaxy Mart. I could see it. You in a nice green vest stocking shelves. The look would really suit you. Oh, fuck off. Get out of here, I screeched. Ambassador Johnson snickered, and then, at last, departed from my office. I picked my box up off the floor and looked around the room a final time. This was supposed to be my life, but somehow, it had been taken away. It didn't matter, though. I would earn back the fickle citizen's support by spreading the truth about the humans to anyone who would listen. Maybe I could make a blog or float around as a guest on the talk shows. Whatever it took to get the message across. There was a knock on the door, and my skin prickled with annoyance. That was a human gesture to request entry which meant Ambassador Johnson had come back. Wonderful. Stupid human. You've had enough fun. I'm on my way now, I muttered. A male voice, cold as ice, answered back. I'm not human, and you're not going anywhere. Something smooth and metallic pressed into the back of my neck, which felt like a gun. Fear surged through my body as it dawned on me what was happening. The humans had sent an assassin after me, hadn't they? I couldn't say I was surprised, but I couldn't fathom why he didn't just pull the trigger. I turned to face my assailant with slow, non-threatening movements. To my surprise, he was telling the truth. He wasn't human. I didn't recognize his species either. There were no flat, 
nosed purple skin bipeds on the Federation's registry, to the best of my knowledge. Who are you? I stammered. The strange man nodded toward my desk chair. Why don't you take a seat? I inched back, following his instructions. We should talk about this. Whatever the humans paid you, I can give you more. Double, even. The humans have nothing to do with this. I'm here because everything I've ever known, everyone I've ever cared about, is gone. You have no idea what true pain is. Look, if you're depressed, there are ways to get help. You don't have to hurt me. You don't have to hurt anyone, okay? That's where you're wrong. I'm the last survivor of my species. Someone has to pay for that. Something clicked in my head, although it sounded ludicrous. How could anyone have survived a supernova? You're a devourer, I whispered. His facial muscles twitched. I don't like that word. My name is Byam. Okay, then. Byam, listen to me. The humans were set on genocide from the beginning. There was nothing I could do. I forced a sympathetic expression onto my face. It was difficult to think with a gun pointed at my head, but I knew I needed to redirect his anger. Commander Rykoff is the one you want. He's here in the building. He killed your people, not me. No, I needed to understand why this had happened, and it all leads back to you. Rykoff tried to rescue us, but you sabotaged the stealth ships. In fact, with your sabotage, you tried to force the humans to kill us, he said, voice shaking with anger. They could have finished evacuating my planet if they didn't need a detour to deal with you if you didn't start civil war, and if they didn't need to repair their ship after. Ultimately, you are responsible. It wasn't like that. You don't understand. I needed them to slip up so the entire universe could see their true face. In all of its ugliness, the humans have been conning the galaxy for centuries while they plot and build up an arsenal to kill us all. It was a calculated risk to save them. Federation from an evil you can't fathom. A calculated risk is a planetary extinction event some minor sacrifice to you. You are the evil one. You are the evil one. You don't deserve the nitrogen you breathe. Say goodbye to your miserable existence. It seemed that talking by him down was out of the question. The devourer had a crazed look on his face. His veins were about ready to pop out of his neck. His finger was hovering over the trigger as he tried to hold the gun steady. I wanted to call for help, but he would take me out as soon as I reached for my holopad. Barring a miracle, this seemed like it would be the end. The door swung open, and Ambassador Johnson waltzed in, looking at a piece of paper. Ula, old pal, I had some time on my hands, so I drafted up a resume for you. Take a look. The human glanced up, and the color drained from her face as she spotted the gun. I wasn't sure whether to beg her for help or to talk by him into shooting her instead. Leave. Now. This has nothing to do with you, he hissed. Johnson raised her hands in a placating gesture. I've read about you in the mission reports. I am right. Put the gun down. You don't want to do this. Yes, I do. I want this vermin dead. A tear rolled down his cheek, and he quickly wiped it away. I tried to save my people, and I failed. Vengeance is all that's left. It's not your fault. Please, don't let your pain and your hatred define you, Byam. You're better than that. Revenge won't help in the long run. I don't care if it helps. Why should she live? when millions will never see another day because of her. How is that fair? It's not. People like Ula are terrible. Believe me, I agree with you. But if we stoop to their level, they win. And I'm too petty to let them win. That's where we differ, human. I'm more than happy to let Ula have her victory. The devourer checked the sights a final time, grinning at me. Byam was about to dampen the trigger when Ambassador Johnson lunged at him, grabbing his dominant arm. She tugged it down as the gun went off, blasting a hole in the floor. 
The duo tumbled to the ground, wrestling for control of the firearm. My mind was reeling as I stared at the skirmish. Why was the ambassador trying to help? This was her chance to get rid of me, without any blood on the hands of the Terran government. Humans were supposed to enjoy carnage anyways. There was no reason for her to put herself in the line of fire for a sworn enemy. Ambassador Johnson twisted at his wrist, trying to loosen his grip on the gun. Bayam reached out with his free arm and picked up a stray shard of glass from the floor. With a swift motion, he jabbed it into her thigh. The human yelped in pain, and her lapse in concentration allowed the devourer to break free. He shrugged off her grasp and began crawling away. The thought occurred me to run or to join in the fray, but I was paralyzed. Something in my brain had shut off, and I couldn't flip it back on. Bayam struggled to his feet, using the desk for support. He leveled the gun at Ambassador Johnson, who was nursing her wounded leg. Crimson blood had soaked through her navy blue pants, turning them purple. I didn't know much about human anatomy, but she must have been hit in some sort of blood vessel. Stay down. I don't want to hurt you, he pleaded. The gun swiveled back toward me, and I steeled myself for the inevitable. There was no sense in begging for forgiveness from either of them, because I wasn't sorry. Sure, my methods hadn't been perfect, but I was the only one brave enough to stand up against those human wretches, to make sacrifices for the well-being of the Federation. There was a sharp searing pain in my forehead. I crumpled in my seat, watching as the world became fuzzy. It was all so grainy, so out of focus. I was dimly aware, in the recesses of my consciousness, of Byam running from the scene of the crime. My ears registered the words of Ambassador Johnson, calling for help on her holopad. But I was too far gone to process anything but the cold sensation washing over my body. Nothingness overtook my senses, and I sank into the arms of the void. Terran Command had reluctantly furnished a new vessel for us, after determining that the flagship was damaged beyond repair. This one had nicer accommodations, since its primary function was in a diplomatic capacity. Its maiden voyage would be tonight, as the humans were hosting an ensemble of Federation dignitaries and officers. The plan was to give a brief overview of Earth's military history, as well as its current arsenal. The new speaker was making a genuine effort to smooth things over, but I knew it would be difficult. Many of the representatives still struggled with the truth, and Ula's death had raised new suspicions, especially since Ambassador Johnson had been in the room when she was killed. While security footage of the assassination showed Byam pulling the trigger, that hadn't stopped conspiracy theorists from claiming the Terrans orchestrated the whole thing that the altercation between the ambassador and the devourer was staged. To be honest, I wasn't convinced they were wrong. Not that it would bother me if the humans were behind it. What nagged at me was witnessing my own funeral on television. I felt like a traitor to the Jatari, and that thought made me sick to my stomach. All I wanted was to return home, to reclaim my old life, to stand behind the helm of my own ship one last time. Killa, you look unwell. I lifted my head, spotting Rykov at the entrance to my quarters. He must have just returned from the capital in advance of tonight's conference. Between his bloodshot eyes and the splint on his nose, I thought he looked worse than I did. I forced a smile. Welcome back, Mikhail. Or is that General Rykov now? He winced. I'm sorry. I never meant to steal your job. I haven't accepted yet. I can... Don't be stupid. You deserve it. I don't know that I do, but thank you. Anyhow, I just wanted to let you know. You should be off the ship within the hour. It wouldn't be good for either of us to field questions about how you came back from the dead. I figured as much. Good. There's a shuttle waiting for you in the hangar bay. I've made arrangements for you to spend a couple days planetside might help you adjust to human culture, and at worst, it's paid time off. Anything beats dealing with politicians. You have fun with that. 
at least these ones aren't. Ah, shouldn't speak ill of the dead. The mention of Ula piqued my curiosity, but I figured I should refrain from asking about her. If the Terrans did it arrange her assassination, then it wasn't a subject they wanted to discuss. Learning their secrets never ended well at any rate. It was how I got stuck here in the first place. When it came to the humans, some questions were best left unanswered. I stared at the floor, trying to quell the resentment brewing in my mind. We probably shouldn't speak about her at all. Rykov must have read something in my expression because his eyes narrowed. You want to know if we killed Eula, don't you? As far as I know, we weren't directly involved. That implies you were indirectly involved, I pointed out. Well, I feel sorry for Byam. A remorseful expression crossed his face, and his voice became subdued. I sensed something was off last time he was here, after the refugee camp was destroyed, but I never thought this would be the result. Nobody could have expected that. I mean, how did he even get a gun into the hall in the first place? That's the crazy part. He tagged along with the press and slipped the gun into a sound engineer's bag. Security barely gives the media a second glance. Once he got past the metal detectors, he just pickpocketed back. Clever bastard. Perhaps he has a chance. On the run? Maybe. For what it's worth, I hope we never find him. Something tells me you won't look that hard. I think I've already said too much, Kilon. I fought back the scathing reply in my head, which was that it didn't matter. There was no love lost between Ula and the Terrans. Of course, they wouldn't be chomping at the bit to bring her killer to justice. Who was I going to tell that wasn't human, anyways? Right then. Well, I suppose this is goodbye, I said. For now. Take care of yourself, all right? With that, Rykov waved farewell and disappeared down the corridor. As solitude presided once more, my longing to reach out to my people grew insatiable. In the name of friendship could I watch the Terran military, at best, render my species obsolete. Was preserving my image really more important than ensuring the survival of my race? The humans slumbered now, but their history showed what they were capable of, under the right circumstances. It seemed unlikely that they would set off a supernova in the middle of the night. But the problem was that they could. The only way to counter such a possibility was to catch up to their technology. Like how Earth had super weapons tucked away, just in case. If the worst came to fruition, the Jatari deserved a fighting chance. Risks be damned. This was my final service to my planet. I fetched a razor from my go-bag and sliced it across the palm of my hand. Then my fingers uncorked an empty water bottle, and I allowed my blood to drip into the container. The nanite sealed off the wound with haste, but not before a usable sample had seeped to the bottom. I pried a piece of paper from my notepad and laid it out on my desk. As I fished out a pen, the words seemed to flow from my hand of their own volition. The new arms race is upon us. The entire Federation is scrambling to imitate human technology. But with this blood sample, we can be the first. This is just a taste of their classified genetic engineering project. Research in this field should stay our little secret. Building an arsenal should be the primary focus. But as you can see, there are civilian uses for the nanites as well. Medicine construction. Don't let the humans see we've caught up. They wouldn't react well to us leveling the playing field. Hell, it might incentivize them to build something worse. Trust me, keep this one off the books. Taya, friend. I folded the note, then attached it to the bottle with a rubber band. A glance at my holopad confirmed the route to the guest chambers. As a newly minted Terran officer, I had clearance to review tonight's guest list as well. Jatari Ambassador Palam was booked for Room C-14, which therefore was my destination. The mission was quite simple. Drop off the parcel, then head to the hangar bay for a well-deserved vacation. All I knew as I set off from my quarters was that this felt right. Several humans crossed my path, 
but they were of no concern. As long as I acted normal, I knew they wouldn't give me a second glance. My detour to room 14 was brief anyways, in and out before any onlookers could develop suspicions. It took only a few seconds to slip the package beneath Palum's pillow, and then I carried on to the hangar bay as planned. With any luck, the Jatari ambassador would notice my correspondence when he retired to his chambers. Would Commander Rykov understand if what I had done ever came to light? If our roles were reversed, I doubted he would abandon Earth. Perhaps in my position, he would have taken similar actions. It was too much to ask of a soldier, to turn his back on those he swore to protect. The potential consequences of my decision were not to be understated. I knew that. We were dealing with the human's warfare, the kind without honor and without winners. This breach not only risked incurring the Terran's anger, but also elevated the chance of galactic destruction. The more parties that possessed nanite weapons, the more likely it was that someone would use them. But those dangers could be dealt with at a later date. It didn't matter that we were living in a tinderbox unless someone created a spark. I was going to put the terrible things I had witnessed out of my mind in the hopes that one day they would be truly forgotten. Today, it was my intention to live it up and hope the humans stayed friends for a little while longer.